Good evening, and welcome to Sunday evenings at Clavier House, presented by Clavier House, purveyor of the finest pianos for both sale and restoration. Tonight, we have a very interesting program of pianist Sukyung Cho, which is the four Schubert sonatas written in the year 1817, the subject of her doctoral dissertation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about her uh, position right now at uh, Grand Valley State University in Michigan. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, during the interview, but suffice it to say, the four sonatas are A minor, Deutsch 537, A flat, Deutsch 557, E minor, Deutsch 566, and B major, Deutsch 575. A very interesting variety of works of Schubert, all written in 1817. Without further ado, Suk Young Cho. And that got evolved into my first CD project, uh, which I released, I think, about two years ago um, with these four sonatas. Um, this 1817 is really the first year that Schubert um, delved into this piano sonata genre. Up until then, he had not written that many sonatas in a single year. So I guess we'll talk more about that later. But um, those are these sonatas are very experimental in nature. Um, but um, I find it very charming, uh, very youthful, and so I hope you enjoy the program. Thanks so much for having me here, and it's a privilege to share these sonatas with you tonight.
First things first, I want to thank you all for coming and watching the people who don't know the Super Bowl is tonight, or perhaps don't care. Uh, <laughs> however, the first thing I want to say is that usually when somebody tells me they're playing an all Schubert recital, I cringe. Because most of the time, the programming is so uninteresting and usually consists of the last three sonatas, which, in my humble opinion, is the second worst a uh, program for a pianist that can be uh, offered to the public, the worst being the last three Beethoven sonatas. However, your uh, project here really mixes so many different styles, never mind the fact you played so beautifully and elegantly and musical, and it was wonderful, and held my interest for the entire 90 minutes. That never happened with the A major and the B flat next to each other, the two opus posthumous. So well, where did the, w tell me where the idea came up. Of doing four of, sonatas. Of doing the four 1817 sonatas. So I looked at, when I looked at eight, uh, Deutsch 575, um, by the way, if you want to read more about it, it's on my website. I have a dedicated page on my website for this. Just for that just sonata? For, well, just for, just for this city project, and there's a link to my dissertation and, oh. and all that, Yeah, if you're interested. Um, but I, I found that sonata fascinating, you know, the fact that it's in B major. I went through, I think, every single, um, like a catalog of Mozart, in, you know, Haydn. There's no B major. Like people just did not write in B major, or like you know, more than three sharps or three flats. Oftentimes. That's true. Yeah, and then when you get to the Romantic period, then then you have a lot of those flat keys right. and sharp keys. Anyway, but the fact that he wrote in B major that is already very intriguing. And then there is four, and there is a the studied rhythm throughout. There are only a few measures that you don't have the studied rhythm in the first movement, right. which is really fascinating. Da, da, also, da. yes. Yeah. Um, and then it gets into like double dotted, you know, in the in the development, um, the fact that he wrote four keys in the exposition, really equally divided in terms of the length, and the characters are very different in each key, and they come back in the recapitulation exactly the same way. Well, not actually. There's like one or two places that are slightly different, um, and 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 the fact that those keys are actually used throughout the um, throughout the sonata in the second movement, third movement, the fourth movement, uh, if you study carefully. And then there's motific um, relationships in, in among, these, uh, among those movements. When you first introduce it in the first movement, it's very, um, it's like just a couple, couple bars here and there, so it's kind of hidden. And then he expands on it on the, in the second movement and expands on it even more in the third and in the fourth movement, it's really everywhere. Right. So I found that really fascinating, the, you know, the cyclic 
um, sonata form, that's not a new idea. And Schubert was really well, well aware of what Beethoven was doing, because Beethoven had done it you know, so much bef uh, before um, Schubert. And Schubert actually, in, there's an early string quartet where he uses the cyclic sonata form, and he does it so poorly that like a very, I don't remember the Deutsch number, but very, uh, one of the early string quartets, and it's not very interesting. But this one, I think he does it so, um, so well that you don't, you don't get bored of this motive because you're not even actually aware of this motive, I don't think, um, if you are just listening to it, whereas the, in the earlier ones, you can actually hear that that's what he's trying to do. So I found that really fascinating. There's so much um, like thinking going on in terms of how to make the sonata form work. And then I looked at, um, looked at you know, like which sonatas he wrote in which year and, and found that, oh my god, there are like six sonatas written in that year. And one of them, I recorded four because one of them, uh, one of those six, um, is not finished. Like he literally stops in the middle of the movement, which is, often is that the F minor? You know, Deutsch I don't. Six twenty-five. Mm, six twenty. Well, it can't be. No, 625. no, it can't be six twenty-five. That would be. Yeah, the, I forget be 18, the eighteen eighteen. Yeah, I can't. I can't remember. Because the E flat Deutsch so five sixty-eight is another one. So from that one I considered recording because he first wrote in D flat. And so, and we have the D flat, but now, then later he transposed it, transposed to E flat, but he changed it so much. He revised it quite a bit. And if you look at the writing, you can tell that it's not, the revision was not from 1817. We don't know for sure when the re revision happened, but um, you, it's, it's very clear that it did not happen in 1817. So I didn't want to include an earlier version of what became a better sonata. Uh -huh. the E flat in my CD and I didn't want to stop in the middle of the movement <laughs> with with the other ones so so I've decided to go with those four sonatas and um, the Schubert scholarship I think is always ongoing because we have a lot of manuscript well we have we don't know for sure you know sometimes it stops here and then sometimes like things I guess turn up <laughs> but in the in the E minor sonata that, that you heard 566 you could you heard that it's, it ended with the skirt movement right um, in the Henley edition they publish they publish it with another um, I think it's a round of Deutsch 605 some of something yeah. else but the Baron Rider which is more recent um, does not include that so I decide to follow Baron Rider's Right, there is there's a little controversy about that extra movement I that think so. some people think is part of the five pieces, five D five fifty sixty fifty six fifty nine. I, I can think. never remember the two numbers. Sixty nine, the group of five pieces. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, I was wondering when you were doing it if you were going to add that extra movement. No, no. I decided to follow Baron Ryder's, um, yeah, edition. Yeah. So all the markings or the all the yeah the movements. I mean, the harmonic changes are incredible. It is. It, 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 it almost, it's almost unsettling in a way. Yes. How, how it just jumps uh, to, to keys, usually using the fourth as a fulcrum to, I mean, the B major. Yeah. The second bar is an E flat chord. Yeah. It's yeah. so weird. <laughs> it, yeah. The first time I heard it, it was so startling to me, which is many years ago. Yeah. I said, whoa. This is actually in B major, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a very, um, I, I know. It's and, and the development is wild. Development of that sonata is wild. But how he goes from each of the each of the exposition keys to to different ones, yeah. But I guess you could say that the most conventional one of these four is the D five three seven, the A minor. Yes. The first one you played yes, today. Yes. Yeah. I yeah I think so. And yeah. of course, in Schubertian fashion, he took the tune of the second movement and reused it. Right, in the, the large A major. Right. The, yeah, one of the last ones. In the la last movement, I believe, in the Rondo movement. Right, um, but, there, but there are changes. It, oh, yeah, it, absolutely. It's not, it's not an absolute quote. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah absolutely right. So, but, I, yeah, I play that sonata, too. I did not know when I played that sonata that the tune was from this one. Uh. <laughs> I don't think I knew. Anyway, but... I, I think that second movement is so beautiful. There are places where I feel like it's a little too long within the movement. Um, well, let's talk about that. <laughs> let's talk about the fact that there are times when Schubert's repetitiousness yeah. get actually annoying. <laughs> well, I <laughs> would you really say it, it is annoying? I, I it, it can be annoying. Really? It just goes on and on. I mean, it keeps bringing back the same tune 
Right. Over and over and over again. Right. I mean, yeah. the, the, the Ninth Symphony is the worst example I can think of of that. But yeah. Well, well, I don't think, I don't, I don't feel that way is in with the earlier sonatas, like the ones that I played today. Right. I don't think they are necessarily very, you know, repetitive. Um, I was just referring to a section where it, uh, where I felt like it didn't feel, it didn't feel repetitive, but it just felt a little long to me. And I, I considered whether to cut the, repeat sign, you know, the repeat in the middle of the, that slow movement of the A minor, but I kept it because I think it's a really beautiful moment. It's just hard to keep that, um, that attention going for a long time when it's so, the texture is so bare and mm. not using any pedal at that point. And well, yeah. I think you did a wonderful job of creating a sonic variety. Thank you. In the pieces. Thanks. Do you have uh, any idea to record more of them or have you played more of them? You probably played many of them, right? I, I played some. I played A major, the large A major sonata, mm -hmm. and also the, the other A minor. Um, Which other A minor? Da da two? Da da oh, da da okay. Da yeah. That one, I'm trying to think. The other, no, those are the ones that I've played. I don't think I've played more in terms of sonata. I've played mm -hmm. more impromptus, but I'd love to play more of, of his. Because, I mean, I think, I think that thing, actually one thing that surprised me so much when I was studying these sonatas, you know, when you think of Schubert, you think of melodies, right? Beautiful melodies. But I realized there is so much dance in, in these sonatas. And I think that's one thing that I, I guess I really explored and, and discovered and learned <laughs> while doing, because um, like anything that's in 68, anything that's in 64, um, you know, the dotted rhythm in Deutsch 575, there is so much this rhythmic, um, I don't know, um, how do I say this, uh, the rhythmic gesture that actually make the piece very cohesive. Kernel, yeah. rhythmic kernel. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. So that, I think that's something that I, so I, I got fascinated by it that I ended up like, you know, buying his, all, all of his dances and <laughs> uh, trying to play them because, because that was like such, you know, part of his language that, um, mm. that I think we often just kind of neglect maybe um, because of his melodic gestures are mm. so beautiful and yeah. What other composers interest you? Uh, I mean, really interest you, obviously Schubert really interests you. you. You wrote your doctoral dissertation on this subject. Yes, yes, on right. the, the last sonata. Right. Um, I love Bach. <laughs> okay, that's fair. I, um, any unusual composer that you would surprise me? Any unusual composer? I really enjoyed playing Rockberg. I'd love to go back and play George more Rockberg? George Rockberg. Yeah. Did you play the Partita variations? No, I did the 12 Bagatelles. Oh, interesting. And, and that, one, that one is written in 12 tone method. Uh -huh. And it's so beautiful. I think his musical instinct is amazing. Like his rhythmic drive is amazing, I think. Um, it's, it's just a regret that I, did, I never got to talk to him while he was, you know, when he was mm -hmm. alive. But yeah, because I learned it when he was alive, and uh -huh. I just yeah never contacted him. Did you him. learn it back at Juilliard? Yes, yes I did. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I yeah I guess that would be one of the sort of uh, uncommon composer that you might be surprised by. No, that, that, yeah. that's a, he's a composer I've always liked, especially the Partita Variations, mm -hmm. which is the major work. Mm -hmm and which has fallen into complete disuse oh. <laughs> for some reason. I don't know yeah, why. Yeah, I'd love to go back and, yeah. I mean, it would be great to have pieces like that uh, that get revived just yeah. for variety's sake. Right, right, yeah. Anybody else you could surprise me with? I, it's so hard to surprise you, so I don't know <laughs> <laughs> how I can surprise Try you. Try me. <laughs> well, I mean, I said Bach because I really want to learn all well tempered clavier. Prison fugues. But you wouldn't perform it, would you? Well, I mean, it would be amazing. See, to that might be the it. third worst program ever. I, I <laughs> well, have, did you listen to Andres Schiff playing when of he course, played uh, it? Of uh, course, Andres, well, uh, Andres is a, an amazing pianist. I, I but know. I don't know if I want to hear twenty-four preludes and fugues in one evening. True. It's a, it's a little brain draining. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, he he does about as good a job as any living pianist. Right. That's true. Yeah. But it was absolutely amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I've been there. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think, I, I think I, uh, like, there's so much of counterpoint in Schubert, even in early Schubert like this, that I want to, I want to spend some time and really study counterpoint and go back to Bach. And uh -huh. I haven't done it for a long time. So I, I guess that's why I've been thinking about Bach. Any other contemporary composers you have 
more than a passing interest in? More than a passing interest in? Carl Vine? But you know, I, why? No, I, I, I'm glad you said that, but the first sonata has almost become a repertoire piece now. Yeah, yeah. You know, there are bagatelles, like is it five Yeah, the bagatelles? five bagatelles, oh, yeah. yeah. Those, are, those are lovely. Those are wonderful. Yeah, those are wonderful, right. yeah. But the first sonata really basically became yeah, a like competition piece. Every young pianist plays it in every competition. Right, yeah, yeah. It's becoming ubiquitous. True, true. Um, yeah, I, I'm not, I haven't really spent a lot of time on... I guess living composers and contemporary composers. You have to pick and choose. Yeah, hmm. yeah. There are, there are some in, uh, some that are worth really reviving and looking at mm -hmm. and others that I feel sometimes when I hear the first performance, I say to myself, I hope it's the last. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's mean, but you know. Oh no, but you know, performers can bring a lot to pieces, I think. Right. De yeah. Definitely so, yeah. Yeah. definitely so, but still, you know, there are pieces, there are many competition pieces, for example, uh -huh. that really don't deserve I see. a hearing after the competition is over. See. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to agree on that. <laughs> anyway, it was great. It, this is what a wonderful recital. Oh, thank you. Musical and beautiful thank and you. no banging. <laughs> we, we like no banging around here. <laughs> It's, <laughs> it's a lovely piano. We had two recitals in three days with no banging. Yeah, Jerry Lowenthal. Yeah, I'm, I, I have to go back and watch. I was giving a recital during the same time, so I didn't, I didn't get to watch oh, it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm going to, yeah, it's on my to-do list. I'm going to watch his recital. But I, I told all of my students and, yeah, <laughs> to watch and a lot it. of his students showed up on I'm, Friday, I'm too. Sure, oh, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure. That, that's like a religious experience for them to go oh, here. Oh, yeah. They're 91-year-old professor. I know. Uh, I, I played... Did you study with him at your I did not. I did not. Um, who, who were you with? I studied with Mr. Julian Martin for my undergrad mm -hmm. and uh, Mati Rai Kali in my doctorate. And I studied with Boris Slutsky for my master's. That Peabody. was a Peabody, obviously. Yeah. 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 But um, I was going to say, I played uh, Mr. Lowenthal's recording of the 90th birthday concert to my class last oh. year you know a bit of it and they're like their jaws dropped obviously and they were like what can we wh what can i do to be like that and i was like I well have it starts with living to 90. no but i was like yeah i have absolutely no clue <laughs> right I don't look know it was you know in 47 years of yeah. going to an average of 120 to 140 concerts a year yeah. that it, that last year was the first time i ever heard a nonagenarian play the hammer clavier mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't know when's the next nonagenarian mm -hmm, I'm going mm -hmm. to hear play yeah, the Hummer Clavier. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's amazing. He just... But he's in, you know, I mean, he mentally, yeah. his, he's in unbelievable shape. Yeah. We, we had a great interview right after. This one's a great interview, too, by oh, the way. thank you. But thank the, you. Um, the one two days ago was a great interview. And I he guess. just, there's so much going on yeah. in his mind and thinking about music. It's, it's actually challenging to interview him. Oh, yeah. Because you, you don't know where it's going to go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. He's a brilliant mind. Brilliant mind. Well, yeah. I would say February 2023 is a memorable uh, month so far in, in, the, in the history of Sunday evenings <laughs> at Clavery House. So well, thanks so much. I thank you very much for thank coming you. out here from Michigan for this. Oh, thanks. I think she had a, she had a question from the audience. Sure, go ahead. I, I'm definitely not an expert, so these questions might be uh, rather ignorant. Okay. So my first question is, did he compose the sonatas in the order in which you played them? Because at least to me, the second one sounded more 18th century or classical than mm. the first one. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. As far as we know, these were the order in which he, yeah. Mm -hmm. he, yeah. It's all in 1817, but month-wise, yes, this is the... Okay, and then my second is ex actually a set of interrelated questions. Yes. First is, um, were the pianos of 1817 different from the pianos of today? If so, uh, did that affect the sound of the sonatas? And if so, in which way or ways? That, that's a great question, and I'm not an expert um, on that uh, to answer that question. But, I, but I, we know for sure that you know he used a different piano than a modern piano, and I, and we think that he used Graf um, forte piano. I have not had a chance to uh, play Graf um, piano, but I sent um, one of my students to Forte Piano Academy 
up in upstate New York, um, I want to say Hunter, I don't remember exactly, but there's a Fortepian Academy um, during the summer where uh, some Julia faculty members teach um, for like a Was week it, or so. Is that Paulo Borgion? I don't, I don't well, I never get his name I know right. Yi-Heng Yang teaches there. Yi-Heng teaches in Audrey, I forget her last Axon. name. Yes, yes, yeah, she teaches she's. there. And there, there's a museum of many forte pianos. Um, and, and my student was Wait, there. Wait, you don't mean the one in Ashburnham, Massachusetts? No, the, not that one. The Frederick the, Collection. No, not in the Massachusetts. It's okay. upstate New York. Oh, I want to, I can't remember. It's Academy of Forte Piano, I think. Um, anyway, she went there, she, she, she was there for a week, and she came back, and it was amazing to hear from her. She was, she was almost convinced that we shouldn't play on a, on a modern piano, but the way she explained, because the sonority just worked beautifully with forte piano, um, certain articulations worked just beautifully for forte piano. So it's, and, and, and I was supposed to go, and I just, I, I got sick, so I couldn't go. But I would love to try it out because I do feel like I have to make, um, well, I guess I want to understand um, what sound world is like for forte piano. And because and I don't think it's a transfer issue to modern piano. I think it's like if once you have the perception of the piece, that should work on any instruments in a way. Um, but I want to understand what the perception of the piece is on a forte piano. I think that will give me a better understanding of this. But I mean, I love modern pianos. <laughs> I, I love the sound of modern piano, so I don't think, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's I'll fall in love with forte piano too. Yeah. One of the things that are, that are often lacking in the period pianos right. is that long sustain. Right, yeah. And I love the creamy color of, of modern instruments. Um, so, but that's that's on my to-do list for we're sure. We're totally okay with you sticking with this thing. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it would be so informative, you know, to to hear it from. However, if you if you want to try it out, we have a play L in the other room. Oh, you do? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an old play L. It's not a Chopin period play L. It's the turn of the century. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting piano. Okay. Though. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I. I'm delighted you came. You can come back and come up with something <laughs> else interesting and elegant and beautiful. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very so much, much for, for having me here. Thank you. Show. So next week, I should tell you, uh, we have something a little different. We're going to have piano and wind quintet and sextet. Um, I think I'm doing the Beethoven quintet and the Poulenc sextet. And the pianist Nelson Ojeda will also do uh, some Debussy as a solo. We're probably going to rotate the stage 90 degrees to accommodate all those noisy wind blowers. But it should be a, a, an interesting diversion for what our usual solo piano, solo piano. And that's next week on Sunday evenings at Claver House. Have a good evening. <laughs>